My name is Farah Fennerty, and I work as a human factors consultant for AMEC. Um, the title of my presentation, as you can clearly see, is I am not a number, I am a nuclear operator. Now, please don't worry, I'm not going to be talking about cult TV classics. And for those of you who don't recognise where that image comes from, it comes from a cult TV classic called The Prisoner. And in The Prisoner, there is a gentleman who doesn't have an identity, he has no name, and nothing is known about him. He is just given a number. That is the way he is identified. And we follow the mental deterioration of this character. And when he escapes imprisonment, he declares, I am not a number, which is where that has come from. So you may be wondering what my presentation is going to be about. This presentation is not to suggest that working as a nuclear operator is synonymous to being in prison or that working in a power station is analogous to being in prison. The reason I use this comparison is that because as a human factors specialist, I've experienced numerous occasions when project planners, safety case authors and engineers have considered the human as more of a number, or worse still, have not considered the human in the system at all. And I've experienced many safety case authors who have said, yes, I think about human factors. We all know that people make mistakes. But my presentation is to make the case for the fact that it is really important to consider the human as more than a number. In particular, to consider the human contribution to safety and how the range of human li lim limitations and capabilities can have an impact and why it is so important to consider human factors. Okay. Hopefully this will work. Great. Sorry, so from one TV cult classic to another. Here we have... The Simpsons. Hopefully you all recognise this character, Homer Simpson. Not a very good example of a nuclear operator, but he does represent the fact that we actually place a high reliance on humans in the nuclear industry and in high hazard industries in general. However, as Homer demonstrates, people are not always reliable. People do make mistakes. We're not perfect. I'm sure we've all made mistakes. Human error occurs. And in fact, the high reliance we place on humans and industry is um, illustrated when we look at um, analysis of accident and incidents. Actually, human actions or omissions are implicated in around about 80 to 90% of incidents. So what can we conclude from this? Perhaps we should rely on humans less. Clearly, humans are fallible. They have limitations. But what I will hopefully go on to demonstrate is that, yes, humans are, are limited, but it's not necessarily these limitations alone and necessarily that cause accidents to happen and incidents to occur. Now, luckily, inadequate consideration of human factors and catastrophic consequences, there aren't too many examples of this in the nuclear industry, though the obvious example that probably springs to mind is Three Mile Island. Another one is Chernobyl. But I'd like to talk through another example from another industry because I think we have a lot to learn from other non-nuclear industries. The example I'd like to talk about is Formosa Plastics, to illustrate the point, of course, that people make mistakes. Has anybody heard of this incident? Okay. Formosa Plastics is a manufacturing facility in Illinois in America, and it manufactures PVC. So, what happened? Well, in 2004, there was a fire and explosion, and this was following the release of a chemical that was used in the process, which is vinyl chloride monomer. Five workers were killed and three were seriously injured. As well as this, there was enormous damage to the environment. There was a fire which lasted two to three days. The facility was damaged and many people were very injured. So what happened? Well, during routine cleaning of one of the reactors, which was numbered D306, the operator went to D310 by mistake. Now, the critical thing is that D3, D306 was an outage and was not operating. D310 was operating. The operator attempted to open the bottom valve of the operating reactor, but luckily, an interlock prevented the valve from opening. What did the operator do? Thinking he had gone to the correct reactor, he attempted to bypass the interlock using an emergency air hose. The consequence, this released a tonne of the vinyl chloride monomer uh, material onto the floor, which is highly flammable. 
the amount of this material that ended up in the reactor building caused an enormous fire and a massive explosion. And this is what led to the loss of death, the loss of life, sorry. So it's obviously the operator's fault, isn't it? No, exactly. There are a number of factors which lead to these incidents. People do not plan to make mistakes. The operator did not intend to perform an error. He did not intend to open the valve of the wrong reactor. He did not intend to lose his life or to cause the loss of life that occurred or the damage to the environment. When these things happen, they are usually a sign of an underlying system problem. There are usually a number of factors that lead to these events and the likelihood of human error occurring. So let's take this example. So mistakes can be prevented. Let's look at some of the factors involved in this accident which led the, op the operator to open the wrong valve. What were some of the triggers? The first and immediate one, when they, an investigation was conducted, was actually the design and layout of the reactor building. The way in which the reactors were spatially located was the only way you could determine whether a reactor was live, operating, or shut down. The control panel was on a different level to the indications with regards to the status of the reactor, and the labelling of the reactors was poor and inadequate. This was coupled as well and compounded by extremely poor lighting and environmental conditions. It was very difficult to see. So what did the operator do? Instead of turning right, he turned left and went to the wrong reactor. There was also a reduction in staffing. What this meant was, was that usually there would be a group supervisor who would um, supervise a couple of um, operators. He would be immediately available. He'd be highly skilled. They removed this manpower and they had an overall shift supervisor responsible for running the whole plant. Significant um, trigger was the fact there was no learning from incidents. An operator had mistakenly opened the bottom valve in 1994, but the wider operating company paid no attention and did not implement corrective actions. There was no process hazard analysis to identify the potential for human error since 1999 and a process hazard analysis that occurred in 1992 did identify that there would be significant consequences for opening the valve of an operating reactor. These consequences were ignored. And clearly, the valve design, interlock design was inadequate. You shouldn't have been able to bypass it with an emergency hose. So why am I telling you this? As I've emphasised, because a number of factors can increase the risk associated with human error. So, there is a belief that human error is both inevitable and unpredictable. However, human error is only inevitable and only if people are placed in inf situations that emphasise human weaknesses and that do not, do not support human strengths. Human error is not inevitable, but unfortunately, inadequate human factors arises when people do not fully consider the range of factors which influence human performance and they don't fully understand the range of factors which can influence human performance. What we need to do is understand these factors, which alone do not create high-risk situations, but when combined, contribute to the risk of human error. So awareness and understanding of how humans act can affect how systems are designed, how they are managed, and how they're maintained. As I mentioned earlier, People do not plan to make mistakes or to cause accidents. And when they do, it's likely to be due to a range of individual, job-related and organisational factors. And what we do as human factors specialists is try and understand how these factors influence individual, team and organisational performance. And then we use this information, as well as knowledge and understanding of human limitations and capabilities, and apply this to the design of plants, equipment, systems and administrative controls. So let's explore some of these factors in more detail. Sorry, you have to see uh, Homer Simpson again, I'm afraid. Here he is. He's faced with a job, a task. So key to what we do is to understand the job, the task. What is it that the operator or maintainer is, is required to do? Is the task novel? Is it complex? 
Where does the task occur? What are the working, what's the working environment like? When we understand the task, we can understand the consequences associated with the error. We can then make informed decisions about what job-related factors are required to support that task and how they should be designed. We can use this information to assess and modify those job-related factors. So what do I mean when I talk about job-related factors? I mean the tools an individual will use to perform a task, the machines they have available, the interfaces, what are the information requirements for the interface? What's the critical information an individual will need to perform a task? What procedures might they use? What is the quality of the work environment? So faced with a constraint, as in for most of plastics of inadequate lighting, we might make interventions to enhance the lighting. If that were not possible, we'd make sure the labelling, for example, was clear, that people had another source of perhaps using a torch or something or a tool to help them see the labelling on the, on the reactor. Another example of where an adequate consideration has been paid to job-related factors is Three Mile Island. The operators did not know what was happening. The information on the control panel did not allow them to diagnose what was going wrong, what the status of the plant was. So we need to consider these factors. Sorry. <laughs> this is to demonstrate the importance of considering things like competence, which is individual-related factors. So competence comprises things like skills, knowledge, even physical characteristics. We need to understand what these are, and we understand this again through understanding the task. And we use this again to inform design. The design of, for example, the recruitment process. Consider a nuclear operator. I would imagine, in fact I know, that you wouldn't want somebody who's a pathological liar, who uh, likes to make risky decisions, who is highly strung. And actually these do feed into the processes for recruiting nuclear operators. Similarly, we know certain characteristics about the physical user population. We will use this and apply this to design. The position of valves, for example. Can somebody reach that? Is it within their line of sight? Fitness for duty is something else we consider. Are they medically, physically and psychologically fit? And the final um, element that I'd like to discuss are these organisational factors. And that picture is supposed to demonstrate things like emergency response of the organisation. So when I talk about organisational factors, I mean systems, processes. Okay, the safety management system, the risk assessment process, the, the process for event investigation, learning from experience. Taking the Formosa Plastics example, their learning from experience wasn't very good. They didn't have an effective corrective action implementation process. And that probably suggests they didn't have a very good safety culture. We talk about organisational culture and a subset of that which has received a lot of attention since Chernobyl has been safety culture. And that basically describes the way in which safety is valued, perceived in an organisation. And all these factors are important. And particularly if we look at the number of incidents that have occurred in the past, some human factor specialists would argue that these are, if not the most important. If we look at examples like Davis Bessie and so forth. Management failures have a big role to play and do contribute to nuclear safety. And so what we do as human factors specialists, we consider all of these factors. We adopt a structured, systematic approach and we apply this to the design of systems to make them more safe, reliable, comfortable and effective for human use. So, to conclude and to summarise, hopefully through understanding the important role of humans, how human error can occur and how, can, how this can be prevented, I've highlighted that an operator is more than a number. They have an important role to play in nuclear safety and to design more safe and reliable systems, we need to consider the range of human characteristics, strengths and limitations. But consideration of these factors is not enough. These elements interact and what my slide previously didn't demonstrate is the interaction between these elements. And we also need to consider the wider task, the context in which these tasks are performed, and we need to consider the influence of organisational factors. As I mentioned at the beginning, humans can make a positive and negative contribution to safety, and this can be made throughout the lifetime of a facility, from design, construction, commissioning, operation, maintenance, through to decommissioning. We need to adopt a structured, systematic approach to understand factors which influence human performance and use this information to ensure that we minimise the risk 
of human error. Thank you.